pray with me. Father, this morning we come to your word. We, we come to see what you have been doing as you've revealed your working in the past to us, always pointing forward to something that you're doing now in and through and around us, Father, and what you will ultimately bring to pass as you accomplish your will. Father, help us to learn and to see. Help us to see above all things Jesus Christ, that he may be glorified not only in our minds as we understand, but in our hearts, and may he, Father, set always on the throne of our lives. May your kingdom indeed come and your will be done here on earth and in our hearts, even as it is in heaven. Father, be our teacher this morning, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to now come to what is essentially the end of this section. We have been looking at the biblical overview, our landscape, and we uh, saw that there were, uh, if we use this lens of the kingdom of God, God's people in God's place, under God's rule and blessing, uh, that we saw there's sort of eight periods See if we can remember them. They were alliterated, right? The pattern of the kingdom in the garden. Then that kingdom perished in the fall. Then there was a kingdom promised to Abraham. Then we have been seeing this partial fulfillment of the kingdom in the history of the nation of Israel. And as that came to sort of a disastrous close, we began to see that there was this kingdom being prophesied. Then the kingdom was present when Jesus said, it's among you, it's at hand. That kingdom then present began to be proclaimed and it is being proclaimed now until he comes when the kingdom will be finally perfected. We come to the end sort of our, of our look at the partial kingdom and as has been our uh, habit of doing, we're going to start with the New Testament and look back and see how we got there from the Old Testament. If you would turn to Acts chapter 2 this morning. Uh, Acts chapter 2 records Peter's sermon at Pentecost there in Jerusalem. After being empowered by the Holy Spirit, he's preaching to a crowd there from all over. that have come to Jerusalem, and, uh, and he's preaching them to them there in Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to start reading in verse 22, but the sermon uh, obviously is it's much bigger than that. Acts 2, starting in verse 22. Men of Israel... Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would not set one of that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he, was, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. This is one of the clearest passages in the New Testament at the beginning of this uh, New Testament era, in a sense, where Peter makes it clear that Jesus Christ has been crowned the king. His ascension into heaven was essentially the coronation 
and he is on his throne now in these moments that it clearly was not David. David is still in the tomb, he says. David said these words, but he was looking forward to somebody else because his tomb is basically right over there. We know where David is. This is Christ. Christ is on the throne. Christ is reigning right now from his throne and will reign there until all his enemies have been made a footstool for him as they are being made right now. And the last one, which will be conquered, is death. And we're going to see, God willing, if we get there, that at the second coming, all enemies will finally be destroyed and God's kingdom will be consummated. Christ is the king. He reigns right now. We are not waiting for a king to be on the throne. He sat down at the right hand of God the Father. He's reigning now. And the king promise, though it's not explicit in this promise to Abraham that we have kind of been using to look at things, if we start now our trip back to, uh, to the Old Testament, just want to mention, I'm going to go, we're going to Judges. That's where we're headed. But just on our way there, I want to remind you of a couple of things that we may not see. So this king promise, we've, we've heard the promise of a people, the promise of a land, the promise of God's rule and God's blessing and these relationships. The king promise sort of comes later in an explicit form. But we get little glimpses of it in Genesis. Remember in Genesis 3, when God is talking to the snake, he reminds him that one of the seeds of the woman will come and crush the serpent's head. This serpent crusher, if you will, is sort of a foreshadowing of one who will come and reign and rule. And then again, as Jacob is dying and he's blessing his sons in Genesis 49, he, there is this promise of a great ruler from whom uh, the scepter will never depart. And he's giving this promise to Judah. And we're going to see how all this plays in. God is the sovereign over all things, always. But he has appointed and anointed human representatives to rule under him for the people. This was Adam. This was Moses, Joshua. And we're going to see the judges, these kings, all pointing forward. Uh, every one of those men failed in their ultimate duty to fully represent and rule as a king under God. Eventually, they got too big for their britches, as my grandma would say, and they tried to rule instead of God. That is the fatal flaw of all people who get in that place. Pointing us out, pointing to us the idea that these human being men were always pointing forward to somebody else something greater, a greater ruler, a greater king who would not fail, who would not be deposed from his throne, who would not bring curse on the people, but ultimate and eternal blessing. I think we know to whom that is pointing forward. And I think maybe you understand now why we started in Acts when Peter says, it's Christ, this guy that we've been looking for since the very beginning, who would be king? Be certain of this. God has made him both Lord and Christ. He is the king and the Messiah, the savior of all things. God's earthly appointments to this position have been partial. They have been pictures. They've been foreshadowings of this ultimate, what we would call an eschatological kingdom. So if you ever heard about es eschatology, that's simply the doctrine of the last thing. So when people want to debate or talk about eschatology or study eschatology, they're talking about last things. Often this is called end times, but there's, it's a much bigger thing than just, uh, you know, how's the millennium going to go down? How's Jesus going to return? There's a whole lot more to that. And I might just say as an aside, I think if you haven't, if you haven't noticed already, our understanding of what God is doing here is probably going to lead us to a very different conclusion about how this is all going to go down at the end than what has been so popular uh, so different from the mythology that millions of people are reading when they buy all those Tim LaHaye books, all these Left Behind books. I think if you haven't already, you'll be getting a flavor pretty soon that that is not necessarily what God has been pointing to. And I hope that if you find yourself at odds with some of these things, um, that, you're, that, you, that you challenge yourself, that we talk together, uh, we need to pursue these things together. We may not always agree at the outset, but I think what we will always agree on is you and I both are not authorities to one another, but this is authority over all of us. Amen? And let's come here. And there are places where we can uh, agree to, to understand things differently as we continue to pursue them. I, I believed some things for over 30 years that I eventually came to think 
Well, I don't think that's what the Bible's saying at all. And I thank God that he gave me the humility to be willing to go and say, I'm going to go and investigate this because at the end of the day, I don't want to be wrong with God's word. Even if that means I have to give up what I have always thought before. This is the ultimate authority, always reforming our lives. These pictures, these models, these foreshadowings, they are never totally accurate. They're never totally complete. And they're not meant to be. They're not meant to be perfect in the complete sense. That's the whole point of a model. It's not the reality yet. When the reality arrives, though, we don't need the model anymore. We don't need the picture anymore once we have the real thing. Uh, I'm always amazed, you know, you show some people and the students that they flip through these textbooks and they see these models or these pictures of, of human development. And then early stages, you think, well, that doesn't look like a person at all, right? And it's leads some people to think, well, that's just a clump of cells. Well, technically, I guess every living thing's a clump of cells then if you want to think about it that way. But certainly there's some stages in our development where we don't look like much of a human. Uh, and, and that's given rise to all kinds of strange ideas like the fact that we had a tail or we had gills. Those are never the case. But when they fully form into a spine, into different places, heart, lungs, different parts of the body, then we see what really, we don't need to focus on the picture anymore or the model. We've got the real thing. Why spend too much time, at least early on, looking at those sonograms once you can hold that kid in your arms? Everybody waits for that moment. Especially, I don't know, did you get these 3D ones? We didn't. Kind of spoils the fun, I think. I don't know, right? All our kids were these you know, vague, you know, 2D silhouettes. And you're just waiting for that first glimpse of their real face. And at that point, that sonogram, even if it's a 3D, just doesn't hold a candle. Right? And, and how many of us have had loved ones be gone on trips or go overseas? And we see in all of these movies and uh, memoirs of, of soldiers, and they carry that picture with them. But when they get off that plane, they're not scrambling for the picture. Their eyes are scanning for the real thing. There's nothing like the real thing. And you're not going to go, just hang on, honey, just wait a moment and then look at the picture. You're not going back to the model, to the foreshadowing. You have the reality. And what we have here in the kingdom of the nation of Israel is a picture. It's a model. It's not the full reality. So let's just see if we can break this apart in, in some chunks here. So going, uh, we left off at the end of Joshua. Let's just cover the historical basics and get those out of the way. So the period we're looking at right now goes from Judges to Second Chronicles. Okay, so these are the historical books. It says Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, which Chronicles sort of recaptures a lot of what you find in some of uh, Samuel and Kings. Uh, regarding the history of David and Solomon and, and some of those things. The time period is, is a little over 800 years worth of history, give or take. Uh, somewhere from around 1400 B.C., uh, the judges, to finally somewhere in the 590s B.C., when the southern kingdom of Judah is captured by Babylon. So we've got about 800 years. There's about 400-ish years of judges there's about 160 some years of a unified monarchy from Saul to Solomon. And then you have a divided kingdom, which for the north lasts for 200 years. And for the south, a little bit longer, 340 years. As I said before, the northern kingdom is eventually conquered. Because of their sin, they are evicted from the land, which is exactly what God told them he would do in Deuteronomy 28. You disregard the Sabbath, you worship idols, you're going to be evicted from this land. And that is exactly what happens. Assyria comes in in about 722 B.C., takes the northern capital of Samaria, and from that point on, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom are never reconstituted again. They are lost. Although, if you recognize the name of their capital, Samaria, you understand then uh, where these people that were so hated by the Jews in Jesus' day came from, the Samaritans. They were like Jewish half-breeds. They were the descendants of the remnants of those northern tribes that were captured and assimilated by Assyria and they had this mixed view of things and this mixed heritage and were hated by the Jews. That's who they were. The southern kingdom then, as I, as I said before, they're conquered by Babylon in, in the 590s, 597, uh, 80, some, 90, somewhere in there. Jerusalem gets sacked um, and exiles are hauled off in a couple waves 
they spend about 70 years there and then come back. And that's where you have Ezra and Nehemiah. It's where you have some of the recording of Chronicles, which covers the history, especially of the southern kingdom, uh, but, but never really established quite the way they were before. And then, of course, by the time we get to Jesus, the Romans are already there, and they're in control. The general pattern is pretty much the same. All the way through the judges, through the kings, it's a sad tale. This nation of Israel and its leaders, they don't fully carry out the Lord's commands that we saw in Joshua to clear the land of its inhabitants. They don't fully annihilate those people and they remain. They flirt and they wink at sin and idolatry and are eventually destroyed by it. This is the thing that comes to destroy the nation of Israel. They don't fully obey. They bat an eye at sin and let it creep around and stay and it eventually conquers them. There are recurring cycles of sin and grace. Sin and grace. Sin that brings suffering. The people cry out. God delivers them somehow uh, graciously and then they fall right back into sin and the whole cycle starts again. Sin and grace, judgment, deliverance, all the while God is sovereignly preserving a remnant of people, raising up people to carry out his commands and accomplish his purposes. So then as far as the text is concerned, let's look at some of these things. And again, you'll, you'll have to be doing your homework. I know that you are in reading some of these things uh, more carefully. In Judges, in the first chapter, the story is basically this. Two of the 12 tribes, they do what God commands. Judah and Joseph both go in as tribes and they, in, they clear the land of the people that were there. Benjamin goes to Jerusalem. He doesn't fully do that. They leave some of these Jebusite people there in Jerusalem. And then the remaining tribes, you can see like in verses 27 to 36, they, they don't do it at all. They did not drive out the inhabitants. And you can see the list of all these strange groups of people, strange to us, I should say. Uh, they, they don't drive out the inhabitants. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants over and over again. And there in verse 34, the Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, and so they suffer. They suffer because of their failure to obey God fully. In chapter 2, then, verse 3, uh, God prom pronounces a judgment through the remaining Canaanite people. Uh, so now I say, I will not drive out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. So we said last time, sin is both the thing that provokes judgment and being abandoned to it is a judgment in and of itself. Romans 1 makes that clear. God gave them over, right? You want sin? You want it so bad? You want to rebel against me? Fine, have it. See where that gets you. Have it till you choke on it. You're going to find out exactly what happens when you choose another God over me. Sin provokes and is a judgment. And it's clear, and I won't take the time to go back and read, but if you jot to Exodus 23, 32, Exodus 34, 10 to 16, Deuteronomy 7, Joshua 23, in all of these places, God warned them exactly of this. If you leave these people, if you don't do all I've commanded you to do, then their gods will become a snare to you. Their gods will become a snare to you. They had been warned repeatedly. You go on in chapter 2 of Judges from about 10 to 15. Joshua dies. And after Joshua dies, there is uh, great apostasy. In verse 10, you can see it there. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he'd done for Israel. It only takes one generation. It doesn't take generation after generation till finally God becomes less involved and less a part of a group of people. It only takes one generation. And when that generation goes, what's left in the wake is a legacy of that. And what can happen when we are not diligent and careful always and in every way to pass on the knowledge of the Lord, whether it is to our natural born kids or to the people that we are around, the people over whom we have some influence, as Timothy was a spiritual child of Paul. And so some of us, we, we have lots of kids that aren't biologically from ours, or maybe we don't have kids, but we have influence over people. It is so important that we use every moment 
every resource that God has given us to continue to pass along the knowledge of God. And that is a work of God in the heart of every person. But mothers and fathers of every physical and spiritual kind are called to do just that. That is the primary purpose. In one place, God says that his purpose for marriage is that he should continue a line of godly offspring. One generation, Joshua and his buddies, they're dead. And another generation comes up and they don't know God and they don't know what God did. I'll never forget when I first started teaching here at Ballard and I ran into kids who said they were church kids, had never heard of Noah or Abraham and didn't know the difference between them. I thought everybody, right? Surely everybody had their grandma as a Sunday school teacher using the, the flannel, you know, the fleece things on the board. It's not true anymore. And it happens like this. And there are a lot of people from that generation who aren't around a lot of kids who still assume that everybody must obviously know all those stories. They just don't. They've never heard of them. Never heard of them. One generation 11 to 23 then summarizes this pattern of Israel's life under the judges, especially if you look at verses 20 or 16 to 23. Uh, in verse 21, again, God says this thing, I will no longer drive them out before you. Any of the ones that were left when Joshua died. God can use, will use, and does and has used Anything and everything for his purpose. That doesn't make him the author of evil. We need to be clear about that. But everything belongs to God. And God has used even wicked groups of people to accomplish his purpose and for the good of his people. There is nothing and no one outside the control and the use of our sovereign God. There is no scheme of man There is no trickery or deceit that could in any way foil God's sovereign purposes for his glory and for his people. It cannot happen. Not in any government, not in any election, not in any daily plan of a personal person. Nothing will keep God from accomplishing his purposes So you can read it there. And what follows after that is this cycle again. These judges who, you know, there you see in verses like uh, 17, they did not listen to their judges and they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. And soon they turned aside from their way which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord, and they did not do so. Over and over. And, and these judges, they're, they're popular in Sunday school lessons. They are. We get a lot of character, you know, Bible heroes like Samson and, and people and Gideon. But this was not a great group of people, right? Jephthah, maybe you were familiar with him. He killed his own daughter, making a rash vow to God that he had this big victory. And whatever comes out of the tent, that's what I'll sacrifice to you. And then out comes his daughter. So he kills her as a sacrifice. Samson, right? He, wants, he was a womanizing thug is who he was. He was undisciplined. He was sinful. He was prideful. He was a thug. He wasn't a great person. Samuel was one of the greatest judges ever, and he has his own book, but he really is the last major judge as we move into the prophets. Greatest judge Israel ever saw, but his sons were evil. His sons were wicked, and he set them up as judges after him. And so there's a lot to learn and and there's a lot necessarily that we're not going to stop and and look at in particular, but when people become their own authority, they make themselves their own idols. It just perpetuates this cycle of sin and suffering and judgment and deliverance. As you look there at the end of Judges, you, you see basically what happens. This is mentioned a couple of times that there was no king over the people And you get to Judges 21, 25, and it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And it did not go well. God's covenant then is being worked out on a national level as God shows his power, his faithfulness, his goodness, his truth, his justice, his patience with these people, his grace and mercy. But the fulfillment of God's kingdom in the realm of human existence is unsuccessful It meets continual failure and setback because of Israel's sin and rebellion and constant turning away. And to be clear, we're not saying that in any way God failed. God did not fail. 
yet he was clearly not finished, nor did he intend for the ultimate fulfillment of his eschatological or end kingdom. His final full kingdom was not to be realized in the theocracy that is a, 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 a government where God is king. It was not to be realized in the theocracy of Israel. That was not ever to be the end. It was not to be the goal. It was the picture. It was the foreshadowing. So now we get then to Samuel, and this is, we're skipping Ruth here. We did, we did Ruth, but it's not a part of this particular story. We get to the monarchy, and this pattern continues. Now, in the interest of time, I want to just give this note to you, but we're not going to stop and read it. Deuteronomy 17, so this is still when Moses is there. This is still the giving and making of the covenant. In Deuteronomy 17, 14 to 20, God gives the people of Israel a provision for a king. You're going to get to this land. You're going to want a king. But when you get this king, here's how he's supposed to be. He's supposed to rule under me, not instead of me. He's to write down a copy of the law for himself from the Levites. He's to keep it with him. It's to be on his mouth all the days of his life. He is to rule with my rule because he's my king under me and my rule is my word. He is to have God's word always with him at all times. That, that was what God's intention for the king was. That's Deuteronomy 17 again, 14 to 20. But in 1 Samuel 8, the people are struggling. They are still dealing with, especially now, the Philistines. And they see all these other people who have their kings and have their monarchies, their dictators, and that looks so stable. And in 1 Samuel 8, verse 4 said, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel, and when they said, Give us a king to judge us, Sorry, when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who will reign over them. And so Samuel does. He tells them, listen, you want this, but it's not going to go well for you. This, this, is, this is not how it's supposed to be until you get to verse 19. Said, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. They wanted to be like everybody else. They had forsaken their great king. They had ignored Samuel's warning. They had rejected God's rule. And they are going to set on a cycle of forfeiting his blessing. So how does this monarchy play out? Well, in 1 Samuel, then, you have basically the introduction of Saul. Saul is the first king. And like every aspect of all these partial fulfillments, there are some positive things that Saul shows and displays. Uh, there are some positive aspects of God's kingdom, but there are flaws. There are imperfections. That's to be expected. 1 Corinthians 13 says that when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. Saul, then, he represents the administration of God's rule and blessing via one mediator, one head. He brings the people under one head. That's a positive thing. But Saul ultimately will put himself in the place of God and his position and rules instead of God, not under God. Therefore, God says, I am going to take the kingdom from you. I have torn it from you. You are rejected. So then David is anointed king in chapter 16. And there is a whole thing going on there. There's all these stories of David. He has a rough start of it. See, he's anointed king before Saul is out of the way. And so he's having to run from Saul. It starts with him slaying Goliath. And we understand that that's pointing forward. So listen, Goliath is not your personal challenge. That, that's, I mean, it's a nice moral of a story, but that's not the point of that story. David is God's representative, God's anointed one, which approaches that which stands and threatens the people of God, and he vanquishes this enemy of God in view of God's people. That is a picture of Christ, vanquishing sin and Satan on the cross. 
Now, it has application to us on a daily basis, but that is pointing forward to God's ultimate anointed one and the ultimate enemy of his people. Eventually, David is hunted by Saul, and David refuses to dishonor Saul. He refuses to kill Saul, though he has numerous opportunities to do so. He refuses to reach out his hand against God's anointed king, even though that kingdom had been taken from him. That was God's sovereign choice at the beginning. And so he struggles and he suffers under this rejection, waiting for his own ascension to the throne, being rejected until he can come to his own place. And we see Christ suffering rejection, suffering under the hands of people who are in positions of authority and placed there by God, but suffering rejection until he should ascend to his own throne. And we see Christ then vindicated, partially in the resurrection, but he goes away to that throne. But at the second coming, he will be fully vindicated in the view of every eye, both the living and the dead. All shall see him as he is. David rules then, and it brings in sort of a golden age. He rules with a greater fear of God, but his sinful imperfection is dramatically revealed in his adultery with Bathsheba and then the subsequent murder of her husband. From that point on, his house is in absolute turmoil. The picture is not perfect because the picture is not the perfect. David then wants to build a house for God. In 2 Samuel 7 is where you get this, and God blesses him, but he says, you're not going to build this. But he does. Interestingly enough, if you you go to 2 Samuel 7, uh, you're going to see an interesting aspect of God's promise. He promises that he'll put a son of his on the throne, that his son will build him a house, and that his son's kingdom will never come to an end. And though in the immediate sense, this is fulfilled by Solomon, who builds God's temple, Solomon also sins. Solomon does not sit on the throne forever, but this is interesting in that what God says is he's going to build him a household. It's what we hear Peter referring to. One who sits on the throne and whose kingdom will never come to an end. David's son then is this sort of a fulfillment of the people of God. Remember God's promise, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Well, who is your people other than if it's not your family? Right? And God said, listen, I'm going to give you this son and I'm going to be a father to him and he's going to be a son to me. So when Jesus shows up and he declared to be the son of God, what we find is that Jesus Christ is David's greater son. Jesus Christ is the people of God. Jesus Christ, as we saw already, is the true embodiment and fulfillment of Israel, the people of God. Let's see if we can go quickly here. I want to get to the application. After this comes Solomon. Solomon is incredibly blessed. He continues the golden age. There's all kinds of prosperity, beauty, splendor. This temple is a wonder of the world. People come to listen to Solomon and his wisdom. But he makes an absolute hash out of it. After he builds this temple, even though there's all this prosperity, he forsakes the fear of the Lord We find out that he marries all these foreign women, which in Deuteronomy 17, God said, don't have the king marry all kinds of women from foreign places. Well, he does. And they turn his heart after their gods. And he builds these shrines and these altars and these temples for all of these foreign foreign gods. And he ushers in an apostasy that brings Israel to its absolute destruction. He flirts with evil. He flirts with the world. He flirts with with sin, and it results in ruin. 1 Kings 11, 11 is where God says, I'm taking this from you. Wasn't David's son supposed to be on the throne forever? Clearly, it wasn't all about Solomon. Fast forward then. Here's what happens. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, makes an absolute mess of things. The kingdom splits. You've got 10 tribes in the north, two tribes in the south. In the north, their capital was Shechem and eventually Samaria. In the south, it was Israel. Eventually, The king in the north, Jeroboam, he sets up these shrines. He doesn't want people going back down to Jerusalem to worship God, so he gives them their own shrines. And he sets up in there golden calves. Ring a bell? I mean, it's just going going all kinds of every which way but loose, right? 
That's why there's probably a copyright infringement. <laughs> Idolatry is rampant, and because of that exile, Assyria takes the north in 722, Babylon takes the south in the 590s, but God always preserves a remnant. And again, God's partial fulfillment isn't picture perfect because the picture is not the perfect. The picture is not the perfect. The model is less than the reality. God dismantles the model never to rebuild it again, but rather to bring those shadowy pictures, those models to their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ. The flaw, the imperfection is the same. It is man's sin. It was pictured in Egypt, in the Canaanites, in enemies like Goliath. What is this enemy? What is this slave master? What is the real oppressor, the problem, all the way through? It's sin. No earthly leader, no king, no master, no government, no blessing, no prosperity, no peace can deliver mankind out from underneath the bondage to sin. None of them can. Only one. True freedom has to be one within each individual person as a spiritual reality, a spiritual conquest of the land, and that requires a spiritual victor, a spiritual king. What God the Father authored, the Son accomplished, the Spirit applies. Regeneration, that is the work of the Holy Spirit, the conquest of a human sinful heart, that leads to freedom. Subsequently, that leads to submission to God's rule, which leads to the ultimate enjoyment of his blessing. I know we're, we're at about 36 minutes now. But if we don't see where this fits into our life, where we have some reason for purpose and praise and action, I think we're missing the point. The realization of the inward spiritual victory leads to a progressive experience of that victory in our lives, which will eventually be perfected when Christ comes. As John said in 1 John 3, when we see him, we'll be like him. Not like God's but we'll be righteous fully. We'll be fully free from the presence of sin in every way. Christ comes the first time as both body and spirit, but he comes to procure spiritual freedom, spiritual victory, blessing for his people by conquering sin first, by conquering the grave. His resurrection and his promised bodily return then assures us that his victory will be perfect. It will be complete. He's going to banish once and for all all the remnants of our enemies, sin and death. 1 Corinthians 15 makes that clear. The true enemy is dealt with first, that's sin. In Ephesians 6, Paul says that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers of wickedness that require spiritual weapons, spiritual armor. And then 1 Corinthians 15 is where we're going to end, and then we'll be done. Jesus Christ came in body and spirit into the realm of human existence and he will come again a second time to complete or consummate his conquest. It's interesting. In his name was Yeshua, which is very much like Joshua, who was sent into the conquest of that evil land and didn't get completed with Joshua but when Yeshua, when Jesus came, he will finish the conquest. He's already declared the victory and he is working out in our lives the annihilation and the clearing and the cleaning of every last remnant of the bondage, every last Egyptian in our heart, every last Canaanite, every last idol, Every last sin, and we struggle, and we need to go forward, but one of these days, that sky, that sky will crack open, and Christ will come, and it will be done, and sin, and death, and the devil will be thrown into a lake of fire will, from which they will never emerge, and we will be perfectly clean and holy, just like him. Let me read as we close. 1 Corinthians 15. Wish I could read more. You've been patient. We're approaching the 40-minute mark. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must 
put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Our Christ is on the throne. He reigns. He is the victor. And our faith in him is the victory. And with that, I ask that we would sing our last song, 402, Faith is the Victory. Let's sing this morning.